All right, we are live uh, here with the Rocket Dollar webinar uh, of Fireside Trap with Troy Eckerd of Eckerd Enterprises. And just as I said before, just do it again for the recording, but you know, these Fireside Chats are a little bit more free form, we'll have audience participation. Um, so if you're ever watching the recording right now, always feel free if you see a live Fireside Chat to uh, tune in, um, see if you can participate, kind of drive the discussion. Um, so Troy, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself. I'd love to hear a bit about, uh, you know, Eckerd Enterprises, your experience, you know, your experience in the industry, and then where you are right now. Well, I'll, I'll make it brief, but here's how it goes. I started in 1985. I secured my uh, registered license to offer investments to qualified investors, mainly focused on oil and gas exploration. After about three and a half years, I ended up with my own licensed FINRA firm, and I had a licensed registered investment firm until about 2009. And so I essentially have spent 35 years in the oil and gas industry, mainly working with qualified private investors who had a desire to directly own interest in oil and gas investments like mineral rights, exploration, production, pipelines, fabrication uh, across the scape of the landscape. And so currently Eckerd Enterprise is made up of about four or five companies that are involved in each one of those sectors. And uh, that has given us a great deal of depth of knowledge and expertise and information, which is why we're together today talking about the, the uh, industry. Great, and, and uh, my name is Brendan Walsh. You might have probably seen me before on a webinar or some of you talked to me on the sales phone here at Rocket Dollar. Um, as far as my experience with oil and gas, uh, so I worked in Chicago as a financial advisor before, but who was right next to us? A commodities firm. So for all my time starting my career, all I was just listening to was all these traders chat and chat, chat, chat about commodities, commodities, oil and gas, everything going on like that. Now taking this job and moving down to Austin, Texas, it has been really interesting to see the totally other side. Uh, so I've actually lived with two geologists uh, from the University of Texas at Austin. And so hearing them chat about the industry, um, you know, one of my roommates uh, works in that industry right now. And one thing that always really struck me is there's all of this chaos and talk about energy. Uh, and something I talked about uh, with Tyler and Troy as we got started with this webinar. There's all this chaos and people are talking about politics, people are screaming about things. However, what does that actually mean if you're investing in energy? And when we actually look at the future of energy in the United States and the world, um, what, is that, what is that future actually gonna be? So I really wanna sit down with an expert here, Troy, today. We're gonna talk about the oil and gas industry. We're gonna go a little bit into politics. I know this is a crazy time. Uh, we're gonna keep the discussion on uh, you know, we hope things can settle down by now, uh, but things are pretty crazy right now. But what I really want to do is provide value for people, an energy investor interested in energy investment. How can they look at this industry, share Troy's expertise, and uh, come out of this webinar a much smarter investor? Um, so, Troy, I want to kick things off here. Y you know, some investors, especially in the last few years, uh, you know, they might have just dabbled in oil and gas, or they might have never dabbled in uh, oil and gas investments before. Why are so many investors usually not interested in investing in oil and gas or oil and gas direct investments? Well, generally, generally speaking, uh, uh, my answer is going to be very simple. Uh, the, the financial qualifications required to invest directly in oil and gas limits about 1% of the population are financially qualified. I mean, and it, it ba basically under the SEC guidelines, most individual companies that sponsor or offer investments in oil and gas at least in my case, we only deal with clients who have a net worth of investable capital over a million dollars. So that eliminates 99% of all investors. So purely financial qualifications leaves a very tight window or barrier to entry to private investments. Mm -hmm. On the public sector side, anybody can invest pensions, retirement accounts, stock, any account you want can buy publicly traded stocks. But I think the real issue is, is that most people do not look past a stock or an oil and gas investment beyond its physical presence. In other words, when I look at Exxon, I'm looking at share price, PE ratios, stock trends. I don't ever really look at how Exxon and what it does really passes through the economy when it comes to things like raw material, construction, labor costs, fuel costs, transportation, and what that may do to either increase the value of that public stock or decrease it. So I think most investors avoid oil and gas, kind of like most people avoided uh, all the dot coms and all the tech companies 20 years ago didn't understand it. Don't get it. Don't. I still don't under bit, understand Bitcoin, so I stay away from it. Right. Yeah. And that, that is the problem is that it's it's a combination of two things, Brendan. It's lack of knowing what the heck happens in the industry. And the other side is 
it is wrought on the private side with 95% of the people that are in the oil and gas business as a sponsor are illegitimate crooks, liars, cheats, and thieves. So you've got a double combination there, right? Yeah. And, and just from my personal experience, when I was helping people in 401ks, like we had a tech CEO and he, you know, he, he would ask us, he was personal friends of our firm. So we'd say, Hey, can you give me some recommendations on this? I've been playing some oil stocks or whatever. And we immediately just put it, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're not experts. We know you, we know you, he's a tech CEO, very smart guy. He was not an expert on oil. And, you know, he was all excited to tell us how he's playing uh, the crude ETFs and get, gonna make so much money. And uh, we told him to stop. And uh, six months later, you, you know, uh, something changed in the industry. Saudis have done something he didn't understand. Right. And he got absolutely killed. And he, you know, he's kind of like, hey, uh, you guys told me. And I'm like, look, we weren't experts, but we know you were playing with some fire you didn't understand. And that's yeah. where, you know, you have to go somewhere to look for expertise or, you know, if you don't know that in interiors of the industry, you really have to take a step back. And, okay, I'm going to either learn or talk to some experts. Um, okay, so just something people you know, kind of snuck up on people in America, um, you know, people that are older, you know, we're typically have been an oil importer for many years. The oil industry in the U.S. has absolutely exploded um, over the last 20, 30 years. And so looking at looking at this new explosion of, you know, this huge growth in American oil, you know, how do investors navigate that? And how did maybe some people, you know, miss that huge explosion coming up, Troy? Yeah, well, one, let's start with the social component. Most most investors, including a lot of retirement accounts and pension funds, have just made a, a mental decision. They're going to avoid hydrocarbons, period, because of their their uh, social effect, their their uh, environmental opinion. So you kind of have a, a whole emotional effect on the industry itself. So absent the emotional side and just more the fundamental side, I think it really boils down to um, you either want to be in the space or you don't. And mm -hmm. if you want to be in the space, you've got to learn what creates the foundation of the building blocks for that space. And so to make sure we're very clear, the oil and gas industry was dead as a doornail in 2008. It was the lowest oil output for the United States since 1941. We literally had run out of oil and we're on a massive decline in 2008. As a result, oil prices skyrocketed to $145 a barrel. So truly, the U.S. oil and gas industry has really only seen green pastures for 13 years. Mm -hmm. It was a complete flip around and it's all been driven by technology. So all the fancy software, hardware, all the fancy tools, everything that is taking place, triangulation using satellites, all that has what's really solved the riddle for oil and gas exploration. So the key thing, the number one thing that I keep telling people the last decade, the number one thing that's changed the oil and gas industry is when you listen to somebody talk about the financials of Exxon or any of these companies, the one thing you don't hear that you heard back in 2008 is the percentage of dry holes. What mm -hmm. you're hearing is return on investment. It's a fabrication process. We're not drilling dry holes. We're simply figuring out how much it takes to pull the oil. We're talking about break-even costs. Prior to 2008, it was, well, are you going to hit 60% of your wells or 50%? And what does the dry holes do to you? And blah, blah, blah. You're not hearing that anymore. And that changed the risk component of oil and gas, which allowed the industry to basically take a 200% increase in output over a 10-year period because it wasn't dry holes. It was how many wells can you drill? How much money can you spend? What kind of rate of return do you want? So it's changed... Yeah dynamics and, and and with these technology you know updates there was just a lot more uh, sorry a lot less small mistakes you know small and big mistakes so people are getting more efficient they're drilling better um their exploration has been improving and uh one thing just to term a lot of people know it everyone's heard it but not a lot of people actually know what it means you know part of this new technology fracking is this word says green politics it's in the oil industry what does fracking actually mean? And why was this such a revolutionary part of the technology for oil and gas? Well, let me, let me give it to you in terms I think all of our listeners can understand. So if I, have a, uh, if I have a concrete slab on an old home that I want to jackhammer out in order to put in a new slab, I'm going to take this incredibly hard rock and I'm going to take a jackhammer and I'm going to create cracks and fractures so that way I can bust it up into smaller pieces. Well, in the earth, because it is compressed because of the weight of the earth on top of it, you have this really, really hard formation, which is just absolutely saturated with oil and gas molecules that are trapped. You need two things for oil and gas to produce. You need to have permeability, okay, which is 
pore, uh, you have to have pore spaces in the rock to hold the oil and gas molecules and they have to connect. If the pore spaces don't connect, the oil and gas doesn't free flow. Shale has a lot of organic material, but the pore spaces don't connect. So the fracking is nothing more than a fancy word for a jackhammering, a cracking of the rock in the ground. And what they do to crack that rock, like sandblasting, they take and they inject sand, lots of water, a little bit of lubricants, and they inject it in the rock two miles below the ground in order to break it up to create unnatural or basically fabricated passageways for the oil and gas molecules to grow and expand and produce to the surface. So mm -hmm. fracking has been given kind of this name of like it's the devil's work, but effectively it's no different than cracking the rock in your driveway when you want to bust the driveway or the old slab out. Mm -hmm. The reason why it was such a, a changeover, Brendan, is that people associate fracking with more hydrocarbon, more environmental issues. And so fracking was kind of the mechanism that took us and catapulted us to the number one oil producer in the world uh, last year. It was people who hated oil and gas thought, oh my gosh, they figured out how to produce three times as much. How do we stop it? Let's, let's give fracking a bad name. All it is is jackhammering with sandblast. It's real simple. Yeah. And, and so this is a technique of oil and gas, and it's also really propelled the U.S. to be you know, energy independent compared to uh, an importer from other nations, you know, sometimes, which leads to all this tumultuous geopolitics and all that stuff. Uh, so that, that's good. I wanted to just explain what fracking is because we hear it so, 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 so much. Right. Uh, I think, hey, this is a technique oil and gas uses. And it's also a lot more efficient as far as getting oil out of the ground. And right. so I, uh, I kind of know, but I just want you to say, what, what states has this been really big in and where is this, you know, really accelerated production? Well, if you think about it, the United States was created by two continental shells slamming together, creating North America. Mm -hmm. When it did, it basically has created over millions of years the equivalent of about nine buried Grand Canyons throughout the United States. So you've got the uh, Wyoming Powder River Basin. It's a huge sinkhole like the Grand Canyon. You've got the Bakken up in the Williston Basin, big sinkhole, Anadarko Basin, the Permian Basin. So what these are, are these the equi they're equivalent of large buried Grand Canyons that when they were backfilled layer by layer, you had all these dead plants and animals that were trapped. So when you think about the United States as kind of a, a playground in which oil companies can consider all of these known, they were known geologically, seismically, they were all known to exist. They were, it wasn't like you had to have an expert to know what's gonna be 400 miles long and 200 miles wide. You could see it fairly easily. They knew it was saturated. They just didn't know how to get the oil and gas out of it. Mm -hmm. Once they were able to combine the, the engineering and operational decisions that could allow horizontal drilling and fracking with the geological and geophysical consumption, we now clearly knew exactly where the oil and gas was. So the game of hide the Easter egg was done. Now it was all about capital. It's all about capital deployment. And that's really what's happened to the United States is my brother, Brennan, used to tell me back in the 1990s, as I'm drilling over here in East Texas, every time I drill a well, I get to this really hard shale formation. It burns up bits. It's hard as heck to drill through. It takes us five extra days. I hate this zone. It's a pain in the neck, but it pops oil and gas. Well, here yep. we are 15 years later, it's, the, it's the Haynesville formation, which is now just one of the largest gas fields in the U.S. So mm -hmm. what they used to hate turned out to be the actual answer for the United States as far as reserves. Yeah. And there are all these places, uh, you know, in, in Texas and in Colorado, you know, other other areas where, like, like Troy's saying, they knew the oil was there. They just would burn way too much money to get to it. So this made things a lot more economical uh, in parts of Texas um you know other states so and then uh you know in, in pennsylvania they're all about the natural gas correct marcella shell yes yeah y yeah so, go, so go. i always say brendan that you could solve cancer tomorrow if there was enough money in the solution versus the oncology mm -hmm. in our case in 2008 oil shot up from around 35 dollars a barrel to 145 dollars a barrel because we were running out so there was enough financial incentive these oil companies were able to take some R&D risk and they tried different techniques because the profit margin was so wide they could afford to have a few uh, stubs of their toe and make some mistakes, but they, they were able to perfect the current drilling and fracking technique because there was enough financial reward. Mm -hmm. The issue then became that we were so successful in our drilling and so successful that we were able to minimize imports we actually started exporting seven or eight years ago, which I thought was ridiculous, but that whole evolution from being a net importer to now somewhat of an exporter uh, created such a window of profitability 
we perfected the system so well, we were up to almost 13 million barrels a day from 3 million barrels a day in less than a decade. We were too successful. Reminds me of the uh, Great Depression days when the farmers produced so much grain, they finally had to just dump it on the ground because it was worth mm -hmm. more to be put in the ground than it was to be sold in the marketplace. We're in the same boat with oil and gas the last year and a half. Yeah, and that's the thing that you'll sometimes hear people talk about overproduction or underproduction, you know, how many people are, you know, producing right now versus not. And, and then, you know, you also hear about natural gas, you know, this spits out natural gas and that can affect the natural gas price as well. And um, we'll get into like the politics of that in a little bit. I just wanted Troy to explain some of those things and, you sure. know, localities where that takes place. Um, it, so, you know, as far as the oil and gas industry, where do you, where does, where do you look for information and where's the average investor? Where's a good place for them to get educated and find information on these types of investments? Well, I'll, I'll preface that by saying it depends on what they're looking for. If I'm looking for oil and gas publicly traded stocks, I want to I want to start to discern which part of the sector is probably distressed as far as value in the marketplace that gives me a chance for an arbitrage or a profit opportunity, right? So I don't necessarily want to maybe be in drilling today because it's uncertain how fast the rigs will come back, and I don't want to be relying on rig rates. But I very well very well may be interested in buying publicly traded stocks that own a lot of acreage. They have a very strong presence in some of the more prolific liquid rich basins like the Permian, the Eagleford, the Anadarko Basin in Oklahoma, because as prices rise, they're going to take advantage of drilling and doing high entitlement value creation, meaning there's a little more wells on their existing property and their stock will rise. Brendan, I'll tell you what I told my partners internally about six weeks ago, maybe eight weeks ago. I said, look, if you follow Exxon over the last 20 years, Exxon stock price is almost mirrored the price of West Texas Intermediate by about four to five dollars. Mm -hmm. Exxon was down to thirty-four dollars a share. I told them around thirty-five a share. It says going to fifty or sixty, and sure enough, Exxon is just trailing WTI price by four dollars a share. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Because the market sees Exxon as a huge storage tank of reserves that have been proven by the big major, and as oil prices go up, their reserves become worth more value. So if I'm an investor, I want to know who holds those reserves. Is it better to be in natural gas or oil? Is it better to be in with a smaller private equity company that maybe they're publicly traded because they were converted to a public entity? Or is it maybe an old horse like Marathon or Chevron or Exxon? And what do they really have to do? At this point in time for me, my number one criteria for investing in any public stock is their depth of their capital resources because capital is going to be starved for oil and gas the next five years. Who has access to money? Because that's whose stock price is going to go the highest and the value is going to be created, right? Yeah, and I think I think something that uh, I've talked about with my geologist roommates, you know, just put from the finance angle, uh, bringing the finance angle into the oil and gas is that um, often, uh, you know, oil and gas is, is a much more realistic market than we see all these overheated markets all the time. Uh, if if you got to shut down an oil rig, you got to pay people to shut it down. You got to cap it up. You got to take time and money. You got to fire all your employees. You got, uh, you know, that does not spring up in a day. Uh, so, you know, uh, companies, people with capital, people who are nimble um, to be able to spin up, spin down, they might be better winners um, in this situation than people who are stuck with rigs that, you know, they're stuck with assets that they have to shut down, lose out on, um, maybe lose money on. And so that's that, that access to capital, the nimbleness, being able to turn things on and off because oil still has to get places. A tech stock doesn't really have to do anything. A tech stock can go up tomorrow um, and no one really cares. The oil has to get to Houston. It has to get places. It has to get on trains. Things have to get, valves have to get shut on and off. Um, so looking at that market, if it's a much more efficient market at WTI and like Troy's talking about the publicly traded stocks, you might have to look elsewhere for value. You might have to look at people that uh, you know are not trading just at the WTI price if you want more pop from that investment. Um, and so, you know, what kind of investors do you typically work with at Eckerd? Um, you know, what are what are some of the challenges you know taking from checks from a big investor? You know, in this capital start environment versus like smaller checks. Well, the the way I view it is, we just had a team meeting this morning, and we were just talking about where the market's at today, and. And I'll be candid, I've been doing this for 35 years. And when I first started the business in the late 80s and 90s, uh, when I would talk to an individual investor and we talk about a, drilling a well, putting it online, they wanted investments that would last 10, 15, 20 years. It was about, you know, I'm not looking for something I can buy and flip. 
that all changed with the dot com in the late 90s and early 2000s. And now it was, um, I want to buy a stock, let it rise, take my profit, move out, buy. I, they're looking for the fastest horse in the gate coming out, right? Mm. Um, now, when I talk to most million dollar plus net worth investors, I hear two things which I think are completely incorrect. And that's why we see so many booms and busts and why so many people lose their net worth is the first thing they say is, oh, I can make 10% of the stock market standing on my head. I can do hard money loans for 15%. I can do this. I can do that. And I'm like, yeah, well, how'd you do five years ago? How'd you do in 14, 15? How'd you do in 08? They, they are like people on an airplane from Vegas. Nobody's a loser on the airplane. They never raise their hand and said, hey, I lost my entire paycheck. But yeah. you ask everybody who won and one guy says I won. So here's the second part of that. Um, they are so enamored with these incredibly unique financial conditions that have allowed the stock market to rise and for some of these real estate investments and these hard money loans to do really well that you should take that advantage and definitely build your net worth. But the second thing I hear is, is that they, because they have no patience, um, any oil and gas investment is an entitlement investment. If you buy into a pipeline, they've got to come up with a pipeline, get the customers, build the pipeline, create the revenue stream, which could be three to four years. Investors don't want to hear about that. They want to invest on a Monday morning, pull up their stock account on Robinhood that afternoon and sell it and make three or four or 5% a day and do it again and again. I have seen a magnificent switch over from 15 years ago to today. There's not long-term thinking in the market anymore that I can find. It's very, very rare. And so that means that most investors will not like the attributes of oil and gas because it requires a more sophisticated, it requires a deeper pocketed, maybe more patient money. And that's probably less than 5% of the marketplace. So it's not that oil and gas doesn't offer opportunity. It's like standing out here on my highway, on the highway out my window. It just sounds like a race car driving going right, right? Yeah. You can't hear the car because there's so much noise. They don't want to hear the details of oil and gas because they're too busy with stocks and bonds. And that's okay until it corrects. And when it corrects, they're standing there saying, why didn't I do something else? And that's the hard part is you got to get their attention, really. Yeah. And so, you know, as a consequence of that, I've seen uh, a couple things. I've seen investors try and carry WTI without really knowledge of all the geopolitics and all the American industry and lose money on that from bad timing. I've also seen people that, you know, they're, they're just looking for that dopamine game, like you talk about the Robin Hood style. So, so they will pick some small company in West Texas. They have no idea what's going on. They don't know who manages it. They don't know. All they see is boom, you know, this thing has been moving, I'm getting in. And, uh, you know, something goes wrong with that operation, you know, maybe they only have a few wells, all of a sudden destructed. And, you know, so there's that kind of that like penny stock nature of it. Um, whereas, you know, if you take a step back, think more patiently about this, work with experts, there are opportunities, there are plenty of people making money. However, there are expeditions that are blowing up in their face. And you just have to make sure that you're stepping back with the right investment philosophy, the right patience, um, and also approaching these opportunities in the right way. They're not, they're not a, trading them like penny stocks isn't necessarily going to work out for you. Well, the way, the way I look at it, Brendan, is that the investors have to, have to understand probably a couple of simple elements of the energy space for mm -hmm. either private investment or public stocks. One, every single day, every single American in this country uses some part of a barrel of oil that is being consumed and never replaced, whether it's your home, your grass, your fuel, your electricity. And it doesn't matter how much more wind and solar is added because here's what I see happening. If this were the total component of the oil and gas available or, or energy that's being used today, as we had more homes and as we had greater population, I see the wind and solar simply absorbing the future growth of energy consumption, but it's not gonna reduce the current consumption based on oil and gas. So for me, I like being in a space where every day there's a finite quantity that's being reduced in supply, but demand is continuing to go up. And so for me, it's, it's how do I position myself in that market to know that what I own, everybody has to have. Everybody will use every single day. So the key is, well, where are we at in that timeline? Are we on the downturn, the upturn? Where do I position? Is it expiration? Is it pipelines? Is it minerals? Which one is the area that fits my portfolio? And that's the real thing is finding somebody who will give you an honest answer that, that offers the expertise, the transparency to give you that kind of guidance. That's the tough part. Yeah. And, and we'll get into, we're going to get into a little bit of the politics and the regulation stuff in the next few questions here. Um, you know, and, and what Troy is talking about, you, you know, 
people people could say things about green energy and great advancements and stuff like that. However, there's just certain realities. That's kind of what we, a few things we want to get in here today. Uh, is your plane still going to be flying? It's you know still going to be using some oil and gas. Uh, are we going to have electric cars? How how much we are? We're going to have electric cars. They're coming. However, how much uh, you know they're going to be using geologists too, too because they're taking so many rare earth minerals um, out out of different countries, trying to find those rare earth minerals. There's going to be just the same scope of exploration to find all these rare earth minerals and get them in electric cars. It's going to be a long time before we get just as efficient to pull those out of the ground, create whole industries, you know, Tesla and all this stuff. Uh, we're just seeing that stuff finally grow. Uh, and, you know, as that continues to become more efficient over many years. Um, so I wanted to get into some political realities really quickly. Uh, you know, people say, hey, I hear a Green New Deal coming. I'm scared. Uh, AOC said this, I'm freaking out. Uh, my oil investments are gonna do whatever. Um, we'll talk about that in a second, but I just wanna bring up some political realities sometimes people don't always think about. Um, you know, Troy, we've got energy producers in Texas, Colorado, uh, Pennsylvania, Alaska. What, what are some other, are there any other states? Louisiana, offshore? Wyoming, Pennsylvania, Wyoming. Ohio, Michigan, uh, North Dakota, Montana. Uh, it's now in Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. I mean, we've got a solid 20 states, uh, maybe 25 states that have oil and gas presence, including California. Okay. Yeah, at California as well. And and one thing I'll just bring up a few comments I've seen. Everyone says, oh, my God, the Dems suddenly took, uh, they took the Congress and the Senate. Uh, oil's done. Energy is done. However, if you actually look at what people are saying, uh, you know, most Republicans just generally, they're pretty pro-energy no matter what. Uh, and they're, they're also popular in those en uh, energy producing states. But you have Democrats in these states energy producing that maybe they get a bit purple and some Democrats come up. If you look at the statements of those Democrats, I just Googled some earlier today before this webinar, you'll see Democrats from Pennsylvania. You'll see, uh, you know, Democrats from Colorado. Uh, as soon as this conversation comes up, let's heavily re um, regulate energy. Um, you know, Hickenlooper, Michael Bennett, um, Connor Lamb, uh, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf, um, you know, Bob Casey, these names come up and you'll see them, hey, hey, guys, let's slow down. Let's make sure we have a moderate approach. Let's make sure we listen to the geologists. Let's make sure we have a conversation with them. And so I, what I've seen is a lot of people suddenly, they see a Dem very slim majority and just know you need those people's votes before you pass any, any regulation. Uh, so Troy, what are you seeing on that? And uh, you know, just some of those realities as we do approach kind of a new blue administration, a Biden administration, but with these congressmen from these 20 states kind of pulling back and say, all right, we need to make sure we're part of these energy bills. If I'm an investor and I own producing oil and gas interest today, uh, I'm gonna make a lot of money the next four years with a Biden administration because Every single regulatory act, every single constraint they put from pipelines, water usage, uh, fracking, drilling, federal lands, offshore, every single pressure they put on banks to set higher amounts aside as recoil capital for lending to energy industry is going to cause the price of oil to skyrocket. So mm -hmm. I said this six months ago. I said, you know, I've been a conservative voter my whole life. I would never vote for the Democratic Party for multiple social reasons. But when it comes to energy, I used to joke with my clients last year. I said, I may vote for Biden myself because having Biden in office almost guarantees me 100 to $150 oil. Now, let me tell you why I say that. If you look at history in the last 20 years, when the Obama administration took over the White House, the dollar sank down in the 70s. Oil prices went to historic highs at 145 and the US production output sunk to the lowest level since 1941. The Biden administration is basically picking up the same people that Obama had, the same mentality, but even more aggressive because they got to make the radical green deal people happy. And now they're talking about like just across the board, anything to do with federal lands and water and regulations. Okay, that's fine. But here's what happens. We as a country consume 21 million barrels a day. All right, we only made 13 million barrels a day. We were still importing 8 million barrels a day from countries who don't like us. We were a long way from energy independent. Today, we're at 11 million barrels a day and we'll be below 10 million barrels a day by next year because we're not drilling any wells. But now the Bank of Montreal, now the New York Teachers Pension Fund, now several major, major capitals where it says, we're not gonna invest anything in oil and gas. Well, if you don't have rigs and you don't have money and you keep consuming, 
COVID's coming out of it, which means we're going to consume more than we did even six months ago, and our production output's dropping. There's only one conclusion, escalating super high prices for oil and gas. Now, I don't think that's going to happen this year. I think it's going to happen in late 2022, 23. The fundamentals are the same, politics aside, but you have to have politics because it has to do with policy. The policy of the new administration is 100% wind, solar, and anything but hydrocarbon. I'm okay with that. I'm going to get rich over the next four years. So I'm pretty happy. I may yeah. pay higher taxes, but anybody that understands the space realizes more regulation means less drilling, means higher prices. It's not what we want, but that's what we're going to get. Yeah. And whether this pressure comes from regulation or capital, you know, we're seeing like, uh, I've seen many financial funds that say, hey, we're not investing in oil and gas. We're pulling our funds. And, you know, the big bank does that. That can be a big hit to capital. So if it's politicians, if it's capital, all of this slowly starts to constrain supply. And what we talked about, oil and gas is a much more tethered to reality type of asset. Absolutely. As soon as, as, soon as supply starts to feel some constraints, you immediately start to see push. And, uh, you know, we're looking at a time right now, historic, everyone's sitting at home, less people are driving and flying around, you know, in, in many recent years in history. However, you know, once vaccines come out, people are going to start flying planes again. People are going to start getting back in their cars. Um, you know, oil use is still around here in so many different ways today. So we see a, just a few pressures pop up. Uh, you know, even if a Green New Deal doesn't happen, we see corporate activism and investment and you know, a further shift away from hybrid hydrocarbons, that pressure will slowly start pushing things up. And as people travel more, you know, the market just has to adjust. So it's like, would you, where do you want to be in these oil and gas investments? Well, I, I think to add to what you're saying, I think the one critical thing to keep in mind is that uh, the timeline from shutting an industry down, like we saw last year because of the oversupply by Saudi Arabia and Russia, dismantling those rigs, sending professional experts, drillers, engineers, geologists, they go home, we have no job for you. Mm -hmm. Crippling the financial balance sheets of the major exploration companies. And then you further that by looking at the amount of lost capital that no longer wants to invest in oil and gas. You've got a perfect storm for a real dilemma. And, and the dilemma is as follows, is that when these oil companies see rising prices like we've seen the last two months, that's not really to have them encouraged to go out and double the number of drilling rigs and double or quadruple the number of expiration activity. That's simply saying we now have a balance sheet that we can kind of mend. Their balance sheets have been shot with bullet holes through it and they've been bleeding in every direction. So what you'll see is the next 24 months of rebalancing the ship, putting things back in perspective. You're not going to see real expiration in this country for 36 months. That's 36 long months of production declines and lack of drilling. And you're setting us, we're setting ourselves up for a major trader's market. They're going to say oil is at 55 or 65. We're going to be short. We're going to be below 10 million barrels a day. What's it going to take? See, here's the thing. Like solving cancer, what price per barrel does it take for private equity, stock markets to go, it's just so good, we've got to go back into the market? I think it's north of $85 a barrel. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be. Yeah. And so, so that's that's kind of a given for me in my it, mind. It's easy. It's easy to give up energy in the financial world when it's not doing so hot. It's very easy to throw out a statement saying, hey, we're not investing in energy. Uh, but if, if things start popping again, uh, you know, some funds will keep their stand. However, the money talks very quickly in the industry and people will start popping in. And something that Troy's mentioning is let's say oil demand does shoot up. It's not like these wells can just turn on tomorrow and the entire industry that was rocking and rolling in 2018 2019 is just back to normal it's going to take time you got to uncap wells you got to restart uh you know but you got to re restart extracting all this oil out of the ground and something um that troy brings up i thought is very important exploration we haven't seen much of it right now they're not drilling new wells so who who's going to be a winner when someone's screaming turn on more wells right now. It's the people that have the capital, have the capabilities and are able to deploy it. The, the old companies that have been shot to hell or bankrupt and are gone can't suddenly just appear in West Texas again. They need to rebuild their entire infrastructure. And so there, there, there's one other element, Brenda, that I think that most people are completely unaware of. I'm 56 years old. When I go to meetings, I'm still the youngest guy in the room. Mm -hmm. The next layer down of intellectual assets 
are in their early 30s or 20s. So I've got a son who's 26, who's a petroleum engineer. He was number two completion engineer at a publicly traded company at 26 years old. So the gap in the intellectual assets, the geologists, the engineers, the guys who know from experience what's going on is about 25 years. This last downturn, this 2020 downturn, took many 60, 65, 70 year olds who have been drilling for years and said, I'm done, I'm retired. The mm -hmm. oil companies are now looking around saying, if we have to gear up, who do we call? They're either yeah. retired or they're dead. So your intellectual shortage is gonna be astronomically a negative pull on being able to ramp up when it's time. Nobody's even factoring that into the equation at all. And I can tell you that, again, I'm an old fart at 56 and I'm looking at an empty table because there's nobody younger than me at that table. So yeah, it's, it's, it's you, huge. You can see this visually again, oil efficient market. Uh, my friends, my geologist, University of Texas, Austin, their graduating class fluctuates depending on the oil demand. The size of the uh, geologist classes at University of Texas at Austin balloon extremely during oil booms. They have been quite small lately. Uh, it's been it's been tough to find a job, you know, in this oversupply for geologists and you know these extra this extra knowledge. Um, and and you, you know they they might be winners in a few years, but for right now things are pretty tough for them. So you know not many people are going into oil. Uh, so the, the department is a bit contracted. They're not going anywhere, you know, because there's there's donors and there's people saying, hey, we need uh, geology education. But this is happening at geology schools across the country. And it also, you know, a, a, a person is a person. They move their family. They're in Houston. They're working in oil and gas. Um, if they move out of Houston or they retire, they can't simply just bring them back again, just like wells can't be uh, capped back up. Um, okay. We've talked about a bunch today, Troy, we're at what, 40 minutes right now. I would just say, we're, we've talked a bit about the next year or two. How do you feel the near future and kind of the more extended future will be uh, for oil and gas in America? So, so two sides of that answer would be one, how do I see it from commodity side? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, we're probably back to about 96, 97 million barrels of consumption, uh, which is about five to 7 million barrels short of where we were pre-COVID shutdown in March. So. Uh, I said this six months ago. I said, I'm not worried about oil prices. I said, I'm not worried about demand. I'm more worried about supply. In the economic one-on-one -on -one scenario, it's always to me going to be the demand side, not the, uh, the supply side, not the demand side. So I think demand is coming back. It simply has shifted what type of demand. It's gone from being on airplanes to RVs and boats and, and all the stuff. People are staying at home and they're buying gardening tools. And so construction is crazy across the country. So it's new homes and manufacturing. So we're still consuming the same and we will be the same. So from the next year to two years, I think we'll easily be back to 100% pre-COVID demand within 12 months. That's my opinion. I think the second part of that is, is that now we have to look at the, um, the outlier, which is the effect of the new administration, what that does to possibly transportation, processing, expiration, and, and essentially the amount of opportunities because of federal lands maybe being completely shut in. So when I think about the demand side, totally comfortable, we're gonna be back, back to where we were in 12 months. From the supply side, I think it's even worse. I think we now are gonna see as much as 10 to 15% or more of the supply, supply side eliminated or completely capital constrained. So when I look at 12 months, I see oil closing easily the end of this year, 2021, at about 55 to $60 a barrel. I still think it can be 65, but I think we've got some absorption. We've got about a half a billion barrels globally still in excess supply won't be absorbed until late summer. But when I look at the next 24 months, let's say 2022, 23, I think we're gonna see a real spread between demand and supply, at least domestically. And I think that's gonna set us up for a real spike in oil and gas. And I don't think it's gonna be sustainable for four or five years. I think we'll see this huge spike. It'll level off, we'll probably still be between 65 and $85 a barrel. Mm -hmm. All that said, there are some real opportunities for investors out there. They can buy directly into mineral rights. They can buy directly into equities that are doing really well. Uh, there's some really, really strong stocks out there. I said four months ago, you should buy. But to be specific to your question, 12 months, continue rise and solidification within the industry. A lot of players are going to go away. Big oil companies are going to cut off non-core assets and try to dump them. I have a client who's a bankruptcy attorney, Brendan. He said, all these bankruptcies he's managing, they're getting no bids on producing property, zero to no bids, meaning we've got these assets, nobody wants it. What's that doing? That means it's further pushing pressure down a little bit. 
but that's going to change as prices rise. And so then you'll start seeing new capital participants. So we're probably in limbo for six to 12 months. So by the end of this year, you're going to see everybody kind of recapitalize and start to tear off. 2022 should be a rocket year for oil and gas as far as new capital coming in. Five years, I think we're still going to level off at $70, $80 a barrel. And I think natural gas is going to be 275 to 350 because that's what it's going to take to get capital to reenter the market. Anything less than that, capital is going to go do something else, buy more Tesla stock or, you know, wherever they go. Yeah, I'm more excited. And uh, all right, so we'll, we'll close things up here. I appreciate, you know, let us know a little bit about Eckerd itself. Just describe a little bit more of the firm as we close things up. And one last question before that, where is the most federal land in the United States in relation to oil and gas drilling? Good gosh, I don't know, because uh, it depends on where the federal land is and where it actually has oil and gas. You might have a ton of federal land in Montana, but maybe mm -hmm. New Mexico percentage wise is, is five to one more prolific for oil and gas. So it's not just federal land, it's also federal land relative to potential. So you've got the big states, which are the obvious states, which is Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, uh, New Mexico, right along that Rocky Mountains is loaded with shale and, and tons of uh, federal lands. And that's exactly where the people that live in the states, like Colorado, I mean, it's anti oil and gas within the state. They passed legislation that's really made it tough for oil and gas companies to develop their assets. So we personally avoid Colorado, even though it's a great state for oil and gas, we avoid it because you're dealing in a very, very negative environment relative to future value. We tend to have a tendency to choose not on federal lands, we choose based on the states and that state's uh, kind of. Um, I guess there's a positive support toward hydrocarbons, which might be more like uh, Texas, obviously, and, and, and uh, Oklahoma. Those states, we don't think will be changing any of their pro programs based on what the federal government tells us to do. We're gonna keep moving on private land. So I think that's the key issue. Okay, and, and what are some goals for Accurate Enterprises here, you know, in the, in the very short long term, and then we'll close things up. We've had a great conversation. No, no problem. I'll make it short. Basically, last year was a record year for us in capital deployment for buying minerals. We actually uh, doubled our client base in less than 12 months. We think we'll double what we did last year. But for us, we're focused on being top of the food chain, Brendan. We believe that if you're a mineral owner, you're not worried about drilling risk and finance and debt. You always get paid and you take no risk. Personally, for us, we think that the stock market will have a pullback and all that money, that profit is going to look for a place to create yield. I think we're in a negative yield environment the next three to four years. So if you can generate 8, 10, 12 percent off of no risk minerals, that's where a lot of money is going to filter in. We've had more investment capital coming in from retirement accounts, institutional investors who are seeking to find a safe harbor for their money. And they want to do it in something that requires no capital and, and zero liability. So it's been minerals. We're going to participate in some drilling just because we, we like the tax advantages if the Biden administration doesn't get rid of those advantages. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're going to just keep a very small pace. Our personal goal is a $250 million portfolio in minerals at the end of 2023. We're right on track to do that. And our partners and our company believe will contain some really, really valuable assets. But overall, what I'd like to leave our viewers with is the fact that whether you're kind of a direct owner or whether you just want to play private equity, I'd be looking at some really solid stocks that are the most active. I have a, a saying in my company, Brandon, I said, just follow the rigs, mm -hmm. pop a chart, go online, where are all the US drilling rigs? You'll find out who's drilling and where they're drilling. And let me tell you why. Those rigs are doing the best mineral leases in the best location in the continental United States at these prices with the strongest companies. You wanna know who's the leader in the industry, where they're drilling, what states and why? Just follow the rigs. It doesn't take a rocket science to make sure that kind of information is deciphered. Yeah, so, such a different market than tech investing. And that's why I really love this conversation today. So yeah. thank you, Troy. I really appreciate you stopping by. Uh, I'd love, we're going to throw this up on YouTube channel. So if you see anyone else uh, that you want to share this with, feel thank free you. to share it from the Rocket Dollar YouTube. Uh, thank you everyone for, for stopping in today. Uh, thank you, Troy. Thank you. Take care, Brent. Take care of yourself. Appreciate right, it. Awesome. Thank you, everyone.